Welcome, and thank you for finding your way here to our online worship service at Fairbanks First United Methodist Church. I'm Caroline. I'm the praise band leader here, and we just want you to know that we're happy you could join us today for the service. You're going to hear um, some scripture and prayers and praise music and traditional music, and it's all sung and spoken to God's glory. Thanks for being here and enjoy the service. Please join us in singing All the People Said, Amen. You are not alone If you are lonely When you feel afraid You're not the only We are all the same In need of mercy To be forgiven and be free it's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends. And all the people said amen. If you're rich or poor, well it don't matter. We are strong, you know love is what we're after. We're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And He so loved the world, He sent His Son to save us all. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for His love never ends. And all the people said amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit who are torn apart. Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another start. For this is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love and friends. And all the people said amen. And all the people shout amen. Thank you for worshiping with us here at First United Methodist Church in Fairbanks, Alaska, just below the Arctic Circle. Today is the second Sunday of Easter, April 7th, 2024. This coming Friday, April 12th, at 7 p.m., Music and More is going to feature selected musicians from Lathrop and West Valley High Schools that will be joining us. And it's part of their preparation to go on to the State Music Festival in Anchorage. We each have our own inherent shortfalls that could lead to a disaster, but the Lord is ready to repair, even do a complete rebuild if necessary. Still support and comfort me All my trials 
Together, let us join in the opening prayer. Holy God, it is a privilege to be gathered in this place for no other purpose than to worship you. Thank you that you continue to speak, to make yourself known to us, and to reveal your purposes for this world. Thank you for inviting us to be part of what you are doing. And as we encounter you this morning, impress upon us our hearts, the response you desire from us. Amen. Listen now as I read from 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we've seen with our own eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard also declare to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message that we've heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with God while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light that God himself is the, is the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, the Son, cleanses us all from sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, the one who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, then we make him a liar, and the word is not with us. My little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, they have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
there'll be an anniversary. Yes, 112 years ago, the unsinkable sank. Yes, it went down in the frigid waters off the um, coast in the North Atlantic after hitting an iceberg. 15, over 1,500 people perished that day. Yes, we become fascinated for some reason with the story of the Titanic. Even though it's more than 100 years old, it's become various, in various ways a morality play about what happens when humans buy into their own hype. If the Titanic teaches us anything, it's well that we're all indeed sinkable. The reputation for such statements like the Titanic being unsinkable came from things like the captain may simply by moving an electric switch instantly close the doors throughout and make the vessel practically unsinkable. The White Star Line never actually used the term, however the press did, and it stuck. But there might be some other clues as well. Somebody didn't do their homework when they chose the name Titanic. As the anniversary of the sinking approaches, I don't doubt that you won't be able to turn into the Tune to the History channel and find some special and hear about all the mechanical and metallurgical and navigational and decision process and the numerous design problems that led to the tragedy. But really, the stage was probably set by the name Titanic. The name Titanic comes from Titans. It comes from Greek mythology, a race of gods who preceded the more familiar Olympian gods who battled with them for dominance. And at the conclusion of their war, the Titans, Zeus and the other victorious Olympians fashioned unique pu punishments for the Titans, their vanquished opponents, Atlas, for example, was forced to uphold the sky. Prometheus, who ga uh, gave to human beings the gift of fire, was then tied to a rock and attacked each day by a bird of prey who tore out his liver and would have to grow it back again the next day and simply re repeat the process. In Greek mythology, the Titans were characterized by their hubris or their pride. Ironically, the same charge can be leveled against the builders of Titanic who boldly imagined they could, construct an, they could construct an ocean liner the way that they did. All these put together is what really sunk Titanic. Human hubris, in other words, was the real tip of the iceberg, so to speak. It's interesting that the lectionary offers us this text from 1 John on a day when human arrogance and tendency towards denial is remembered on such a large scale. After telling his readers of his apostolic credentials as an eyewitness to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, the word of life that John refers to Jesus as proceeds to summarize and expound upon the message that Christ himself has brought light, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, both the Gospel of John and this letter of 1 John focused on the same themes, and most scholars believe that they are written by the same person. The themes as darkness and light, themes that were an early part of the Gospel of John, there the life of Jesus is described as the light of all people that shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. In both texts, the Gospel of John and the letter of 1 John, <clears throat> darkness defines that part of life that's apart from God, while light represents God's glory and truth. First John is also encountering, is also countering others in this early church time. Some who said that there was no such thing as sin because once somebody believed, they were always forgiven. Or if a believer did something, it was not sin. He's concerned that people will forget their own human tendency to pull away. And so he wants to remind them that, yes, sin is still a thing. Yet, in 1 John, he defines 
darkness more specifically in terms of self-deception. If we believe that we're in fellowship with God, yet we continue to sin anyway, then the reality is we're still walking in darkness. In, in doing so, <coughs> it makes us liars. If we believe that we have no sin, then we have great hubris or pride to claim that we're unsinkable and perfect. Not only are we liars, but we've bought into our own hype and make Jesus a liar too because Jesus has already cleansed us. Confident, confident in the flawlessness of their own ship, the crew of the Titanic pushed, pushed the throttle forward at full speed, not believing any obstacle could get in their way. If we're not paying attention to the major design flaws in our own lives, then the the biggest one being our sinful natures, then we too will have a tendency to charge ahead deeper and deeper, waiting for an accident to happen. Eventually, we'll be headed for a crash of epic proportions. But this tendency also leads us to want to make excuses, to blame others. You made me mad, or you made me feel bad, or you made me react that way. Passing off responsibility to others is one of the things that may come out. It's, again, a design flaw in our human nature. The flaw is this formulation sometimes that leads us to disaster, just as some would say the Titanic's formulation of its very steel and rivets are what contributed to the disaster. How do we avoid this? How do we avoid this self-deception? Well, first of all, by being honest. How do you avoid the wreckage? John encourages his readers to take a good look at the deck below. Of course, he didn't use that language. But to take a look at ourselves on a regular basis and get real about the, the problems and the shortcomings and the weaknesses that lie within. To slow down. Well, speed sometimes is a contributing factor to any crash. If we're going to avoid the sinking effects of sin, it's important to slow down, to get real about what's wrong. And we do that sometimes through confession. If we confess our sins, writes the writer of 1 John, if we confess our sins, the one who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is that first step toward avoiding disaster because it, 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 it leads us to identify the leaks and the holes in our lives, when we confess our weaknesses, when we confess our sins, when we confess our shortcomings, we're being honest with God about who we are. And we throw ourselves at God's mercy and we open ourselves to God's help to overcome. John implies that it's better to confess. It's better to confess up front than waiting until all these things have led to collateral damage. Better to name all the problems before you leave port. In other words, before you hit an iceberg. Rather than continuing to steam ahead in the dark, John urges us to wait, wait for the light, so that we can navigate life safely. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and with the blood of Jesus. God cleanses us from all sin. Confession, in other words, leads to second chances. Confession and admitting our weaknesses leads God to help build us up. And with those that walk in the light with us, we work together in building ourselves up. We need not fear, for the Lord knows our shortcomings and weaknesses already. And that's the beauty of it. But what's really important is that we know what they are as well, and that we face what they are. Being honest with the Lord frees us. It removes the barriers that nag at our relationship, both with God and with one another. 
It lets us enjoy maximum fellowship. It lets us, instead of being like a ship out on the ocean alone, it's like we're part of a fleet moving together, bearing one another, if necessary, rescuing one another. It gives us an opportunity to revisit our own epic crashes, to memorialize what we lost as a result sometimes of our shortcomings, but also to to vow to, to be better, to build better, to continue simply steaming into a new future without recognizing where we're going, but steaming now into a new future with that light from God helping us to navigate, navigate toward a new future made possible by Jesus, who just last Sunday, Easter Sunday, has gone on ahead of us, has gone on ahead of us and is waiting just as he was waiting for his disciples to catch up with him in Galilee after he rose from the dead. A new future made possible by Jesus whose own death and resurrection ensures that we will land safely, safely on the other side. We thank you as we gather um, for your gifts and your time and your talents. And now, holy God, take our lives and let them be consecrated to you. Take our days and let them be moments for praise. Take our gifts and let them be used to show forth your kingdom, to build up this community of faith, to make it like a powerful fleet crossing the ocean of life together. All that you have been given Let us hold with open hands and offer it back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. From the dust of the earth you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, you saved Noah and his family, and made covenant to be our everlasting God. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people again forsook the covenant, Your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your mountain he heard your still, small voice. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your Spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles that day, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, lifted us like an ark upon the waters of destruction. Now, When we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, we come to you in a time of repentance and cleansing, that these 40 days and 40 nights of Lent we might be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with 
with with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as the children of God, with confidence we come with the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now I invite you wherever you are, whenever you're seeing this, to take and eat and take and drink. Please join us in singing, Blessed Be Your Name. And time. 
both our praises and our concerns to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Let us remember, O Lord, that Easter is not over. For we are an Easter people called to live with eternity as a backdrop. The tomb remains empty. For an Easter people, it is not the end. Every first day of the week, we gather, O God, in your presence to rejoice in the light of the empty tomb. The stone has been rolled away, both from the mouth of the tomb and from the depth of our hearts. We're learning to live ever in the power of the risen Christ. There are days we may tremble in fear for a moment, but then we remember we are an Easter people. And we follow a God who is living with us and among us. Lead us to always encounter the risen Christ in our midst. As we remember this morning or today the words that he taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, wherever you are, whenever you're watching this, Remember, you are a chosen people, called for the purpose of being sent. Go, therefore, to shine the light of God's love, to shine the light of Christ into the darkness, to love in the midst of hatred, to live as those who belong to one another, and the power and the promise of God Almighty. Amen. Please join us in singing, You Are My King.
It's my joy to honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. 